Greetings from Tales from SYL Ranch, news and commentary from the heartland. And I'm your host, Bill Stone. And today's episode, well, we're going to have something that intersects two of my favorite topics, which always makes the show a little bit more fun for me, hopefully so much, a little more fun for you. I'm going to talk about Brie Larson, and in particular, the newest Marvel movie, Captain Marvel, which in which she stars, in which this woke woman has become the gift that just keeps on giving when it comes to talking about get woke, go broke. And I'll also talk about the whole woke advertising campaign that Marvel has been engaging in for this whole frickin' movie, and I will do a little bit of a review of Captain Marvel. So, Brie Larson. I have generally avoided talking about Brie Larson, but she's going around on a press tour to promote Captain Marvel with her very woke brand of feminism that is apparently so ingrained in her personality that she can't stop putting her foot in her mouth even when she's trying not to. <laughs> Now, I don't really care about this generally, because contrary to what the sycophant press would have you believe, science fiction and superhero fans are fine with strong female characters. We have been since at least 1964, when there was a female first officer on the USS Enterprise in Star Trek, the original series' first pilot. We have zero problems with characters like Princess Leia, uh, Ripley, Wonder Woman, half the main characters in various incarnations of Star Wars. The sycophantic press is simply woke and wants to paint us in a bad light. And because we just object to this sort of stupid modern feminism that's really nothing more than man-hating. And um, conforming to modern feminism and acting woke uh, and dumping on anything remotely resembling a man, they're simply signs of stupidity. I am far smarter than Brie Larson, and I can cut her to ribbons intellectually without batting so much as an eyelash. However, she's been doing it so much that it's soured me on the film that she is, in fact, promoting. Now, for example, most recently, she revealed that during a group photo with the female stars of the upcoming film Avengers Endgame, they all marched into Kevin Feige's office, he's the guy that runs that, and they announced that there should be an all-female Avengers team with Brie Larson's Captain Marvel as the leader. Before that, she was, and still does, advocates for more diverse reviewers. And she was pressing so hard on this, on not having male reviewers, that she was forced to clarify her statements so as not to sound like a man-hating modern feminist. And in another movie she was promoting, Wrinkle in Time, she went so far as to categorically state that older, white, cisgendered males like myself should not do reviews of the film because it wasn't intended for them. Well, this channel has changed some fairly recently, and not long ago I was doing nothing but reviews for this channel, mostly science fiction, superhero, things like that. But you can clearly see that a good reviewer can review something that's not intended for us because there are some fairly objective standards for acting, direction, cinematography, mechanics of making a film, all that stuff. And I would mention today's review is not an in-depth review like the kind that I used to do. It would be fairly short with a little bit of backstory to go along with it. What I really want to talk about is this whole woke campaign and how it has really, really gotten people ticked off. If you go to Rotten Tomatoes, one of the most fascinating things is over the last few days, Rotten Tomatoes keeps an index of the interest of people that have, you know, specified it on the website, how interested they are in seeing this movie. This thing has gone in the last week or so from like upper 80s down to 30%. <laughs> Get woke, go broke. In fact, I don't think Captain Marvel is going to do badly at the box office. I'm just amused by the fact that we fans are so ticked off by Brie Larson going woke and in fact Marvel itself going woke with their ad campaign that we have said screw you we're not that interested anymore going woke has ticked us off not surprisingly it ticks everybody off but Captain Marvel's the uh, Marvel Studios themselves has been doing a woke ad campaign, and it's just about as bad as Brie Larson doing it. And the reason they're doing this is very, very simple. They had a lot of success going woke with B Black Panther. 
Panther, rather. Uh, they built it as some kind of amazing new film because it starred and was made by black people, and they actually got the thing nominated for a Best Picture Award as if it could possibly hold a candle to movies like On the Waterfront, Lawrence of Arabia, The Godfather, Parts 1 and 2. Thank God it did not win Best Picture. It did not deserve it. But they got black people to think it was some kind of amazing film, despite the fact that there have been a multitude of black superheroes that came before it. Now, again, I don't usually care about this that much, contrary to what the sycophant press would have you believe, Fans have no problem with black superheroes. They're perfectly fine with it. In fact, we have been since 1945 with the appearance of a character named Ralph Johnson in DC Comics, World's Finest Comics, number 17, 1945. We have no problems with Black Panther. He first appeared in comics, by the way, in 1966. Also Falcon, who's also a member of the Avengers, Cap's buddy. He appeared in 1969. Other characters like Black Lightning, Black Racer, Black Vulcan, who was a Super Friends character on the Super Friends animated TV series in 1977. Other characters are Bronze Tiger, Bumblebee, the John Stewart version of Green Lantern, who first appeared in 1971, Amanda Waller, Amazing Man, Cyborg, member of the Justice League now, and just a multitude of other superheroes that have come and gone and some stayed around up to the present day. The sycophant press is simply woke and wants to paint us in a bad light because we object to stupid modern racism that's nothing more than white-hating. And conforming to modern racism, I must tell you, and being woke about it, and dumping on anything resembling a white male or a white person in general are simply signs of stupidity. I am far smarter than any racist, and I can cut them to ribbons intellectually without so much as batting an eyelash. However, Marvel did go woke with Black Panther, and it worked, so this has caused them to go woke with Captain Marvel. And both of this, with Brie Larson and that, have soured me on Black Panther. I like the movie, but it soured me on it because everybody was going around screaming, if you don't like this movie, you're a racist. And now they're doing it with Captain Marvel. They're going to be saying, if you don't like this movie, you're a sexist. Well, that don't work, as Rotten Tomatoes is starting to show. 30% of the people are only 30% are interested in seeing this film. Get woke, go broke. Again, I don't think it's going to do badly. But... If it doesn't do badly, if it does do badly, rather, it's going to be entirely the fault of Brie Larson and Marvel's marketing campaign, which is nothing more than woke feminism. So, some of you probably came here for a review of Captain Marvel, because that's what it said on the tin, among other things. Uh, however, there is, uh, because you may think here, okay, well, you know, he did a lot of reviews before. He's probably got some kind of cool scoop. He's seen the movie. He can do a review, a good review because it's fast reviews. Well, you're right and you're wrong. I am doing a review of Captain Marvel, just not the one you think. I'm going to review the 1941 movie serial Adventures of Captain Marvel. Yes, I have done a bait and switch on you. However, I hope that you'll continue watching this review because I think it's a really good movie serial. It's uh, one of the best, in fact, not the best uh, movie serial I've ever seen. And you don't have to deal with a woke advertising campaign that's going to soil you on it before you even get a chance to watch. So a little bit of backstory on the character. The original Captain Marvel first appeared in Whiz Comics number no. 2 in February of 1940. It was published by Fawcett Comics, who was a competitor to what would become DC Comics as well as what would become Marvel Comics. And the Cap went on to appear in many other Fawcett titles um, and spawned a number of other characters who were members of what we would eventually call the Shazam family. And in fact, if you're old enough to know, like me, you may understand why I uh, have in my background today a, uh, well, what we used to call, uh, growing up, the Shazam van. In a later adaptation in the 1970s, Billy Batson, who was the main character, drove around the country in his van, which was, in fact, exactly this model, um, and uh, right wrongs and, uh, you know, do make things uh, more palatable for justice. 
In any case, Cap had his Shazam family, and the character was a 10-year-old radio announcer named Billy Batson, who, when he spoke the magic word Shazam, would cause a lightning bolt to come down and strike him, turning him into the adult Captain Marvel, the world's mightiest mortal. While Cap and his story, his backstory, are very uh, dissimilar to Superman, his powers are very similar. About the only thing he doesn't have is Superman's vision powers. And he was a very popular character, even more so than Superman. He outsold Superman in comics for a number of years. The similarities to Superman and the fact that Cap was outselling Superman caused DC to sue Fawcett for copyright infringement. Now, this suit went on for years, about 10 years, and um, that ha went on until about the market completely dropped out for comic books in the 1950s. And uh, Fawcett just simply sold the Shazam family to DC in a rather, you know, going out of business fire sale. DC didn't publish the character again until 1972. However, and this is where modern, uh, the modern Captain Marvel movie comes in, by then Marvel had come up with their own character of the same name. And so that made the rights of the name Captain Marvel uh, very complicated. Um, DC was allowed to use the name Captain Marvel, but they couldn't use it on a title for any of their comic books or adaptations. Uh, instead, they had to use the word Shazam, which was not the character's name. It was the name of the wizard who gave the character his superpowers, and the name of the wizard was what Cap spoke in order to become Captain Marvel. Um, but because they had to use Shazam, this caused the name of the character to become muddied with readers. And in the 1990s, DC just started screwing up all their characters. And so today, they've just started calling him Shazam rather than Captain Marvel, either over rights issues or because the inmates have been running the asylum at DC since 1985. But this, this was a serial that, uh, you know, 1941... And, in fact, it predated the United States' entry into World War II, which is actually kind of obvious, given its lack of World War II propaganda. Other serials that came out in that time period, like Batman, uh, they had a lot of World War II propaganda. And uh, this serial does feature the character more or less, as he was shown in comics. So that little bit of backstory out of the way, I guess, for the benefit of people who've never seen this, I will do as I used to do when I did nothing but reviews, and I will issue myself a... Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert. And as I used to say in my reviews, that is because I am a fan die master. And that means that the fandom is strong with me. And that means that nothing is new, nothing is original, and at worst, I figured out about a half an hour early. This is not a boast or a brag. This is sadly where you find yourself as a science fiction fan after having watched, read, and listened to over a hundred years worth of science fiction. You just can't see the new stuff for all the century that came before, and you discover there just isn't that much that's new in the world. But it does sometimes interfere with your ability to enjoy things. But not, not with the adventures of Captain Marvel. This is a lot of fun. I have watched it repeatedly over the years, and it just doesn't get old. So, <clears throat> if you don't know about serials, movie serials were kind of like TV series before television. They were usually 12 episodes, 15 to 20 minutes long, and they would be released into theaters weekly. That's what they did back then. They were made for children, and there would be an ongoing story that would go through all 12 episodes that would then wrap up by the end at tw episode 12. Now, there were sometimes sequels. Batman, for example, got two sequels. And there were a ton of westerns, just a ton of westerns. They got multiple sequels. But they did always wrap up that story in episode 12 because they never knew if there was going to be a sequel. It just depended on what the box office looked like. Each episode of a serial would end on a cliffhanger in which it appeared that either the hero or their friends were completely screwed. They were going to be killed and there was no way out of it. And that would lure the video, the user, uh, or the uh, moviegoer back into the theater the next week to watch again. And a good cliffhanger doesn't cheat. Bad cliffhangers will take an one of the episodes, they'll take the end of the episode, it looks like there's no way out. Then at the next episode, they will insert a little bit of footage that wasn't in the prior episode that allows the good guys to escape. Adventures of Captain Marvel was generally good about not cheating. It does do it on occasion, uh, but it's still a lot of fun. 
This film, uh, this series rather, Adventures of Captain Marvel, began showing in theaters in March of 1941, which was barely a year after the comic started uh, publication, which probably tells you a lot about how popular the character was. Now, the plot does not, unlike modern superhero movies, it does not uh, adapt any comic's story. It has its own plot. It instead depicts Captain Marvel against a villain named the Scorpion, who is trying to acquire all the parts and instructions to an ancient device that uh, produces destructive energy beams and will transmute any object it strikes into solid gold. Now, the Scorpion always wears a black uh, outfit with a full head black mask so that his face isn't seen until the very final episode, which makes the viewer always wonder which of the continuing characters we see throughout this are going to turn out to be the Scorpion. The plot on this is decent. They do take a lot of liberties, first with Cap's backstory, uh, his origin, uh, and that's just simply because his origin in comics is a little bit complicated and a little big, probably prohibitively expensive to shoot. And they also make Billy Batson a lot older than 10. He's got to be about 20. He flies his own plane, by the way, which makes no sense, since he could turn into Captain Marvel and fly if he wanted to. But the reason he did that was because they didn't want to shoot a serial with a child actor, because you can't just, you know, work child actors 12 hours a day like they did on these serials. They were made relatively inexpensively. And you have to get them on set tutors. And they're just a giant pain to the behind. So, you know, the other thing is, while this is a very good serial, it is still a children's show, and so the plot is not overly realistic, but it is still a lot of fun. My major criticism of this, actually, is that Captain Marvel doesn't appear on screen that much. And, and you're always wondering, you know, why doesn't Billy Batson change into Captain Marvel? Because it would make a lot of sense at many points in the, in the story. And to be honest, Cap is a lot of fun to watch in this movie. Because the action here is really great. Uh, these serials were all about action. They were really all about action. The plot was almost secondary to the action. And in particularly, this is evidenced by... Tom Tyler, who you see here, who played Captain Marvel. Now, Tom Tyler did a whole bunch of westerns, but in this one, he is doing his own stunts, and he is fracking amazing. He will dive out of the sky onto bad guys from a height that looks like about 12 feet. I, I think that they just had some kind of platform out of camera range, and he would, he would literally just swan dive onto them. There's places where he swan dives into the water. He'll swan dive right off of, you know, big rocks. into. It's amazing. He does these really great ones. He does, he does backflips where he whacks two um, uh, bad guys at once. And this was 1941. Cap was not afraid to use a machine gun. They have a 50 cal at one point that he just, he sees these bad guys running away, and instead of going after them with superpowers, he grabs a 50 cal and starts shooting them up. <laughs> and he'll take on three bad guys at once. He's really great. When he's flying, it, when he lands, it looks like he's landing. Again, I think they had like a 12-foot thing just off the, you know, outside of the camera, and he would just swan dive, he'd just jump off. He looked great. It looked perfect. It was awesome. And a lot of his flying here is really good. It may even keep you guessing about how they did it, even today. There is some shots where they're just marrying Tom Tyler to a moving background, but there's also a bunch of shots where Cap actually appears to be flying right through the frame. It's not a special effect. And they did this pretty simply, but very effectively. Here's what they did. They used a wood carving of Captain Marvel, put the costume on it, and then attached it to a wire that you cannot see. And then they would just throw him across the wire. You know, it looks like he's flying, and he, he just goes across the wire. Um, again, it was very simple. It was very effective. In my opinion, these flying sequences, when he flies, are better than any other flying that we saw in movies or TV until 1978's Superman. Now, there is plenty of other fisticuffs, even outside of Cap. You know, the action the fighting, this was a hallmark of movie serials of that era. And they did cast all these various male characters, because they have about six or seven of them, that are able to do their own stunts and you know, do the fighting conv convincingly, um, which, again, they do quite a lot. 
There is one female character here who's kind of a Lois Lane, although quite a lot less independent, and she's treated in a fashion that today would be very sexist, but you have to keep this in context of the time. This was how women were treated at the time. It was socially acceptable by everyone. So it's a short review, but we can ask ourselves at this point, as I often do in my reviews, is this any good? Well, yes, it is very good. Understanding that it's a children's story, it is a lot of fun. It has plenty of action, and again, Cap is amazing because of Tom Tyler's stunt work. It's just awesome. The acting is competent. It's not brilliant. But one of the best parts about this is it was restored fairly recently. The copies of it that you can see on YouTube are absolutely pristine compared to other serials of the OC of that area. They were done really great in like 720p and they're awesome. So my recommendation, watch this thing. You can binge it in only three hours. And if you don't want to watch all 12 episodes and you know, go through the opening titles and the end and all that, uh, it's great to watch it for the, you know, for the cliffhangers, but you do get the repetitive opening and end titles and stuff. There is a very nice fan edit that puts the whole thing together as a three-hour film, which is kind of nice. And I have a uh, playlist in my description box for all 12 episodes, and then the last one in there is that three-hour fan edit if you want to go for the movie instead. Again, this is one I heartily recommend that you watch. You will have a lot of fun, and you won't have to deal with woke feminism that will leave a bad taste in your mouth before you even reach the damn theater. And so I guess that is all that I have to say about that subject for today. So thank you for watching. If you like what I'm doing, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. I would certainly appreciate your support, either via subscribe to star, my PayPal tip jar, or a place on my website where you can support me further. And there are links to all of these things in my description box below. So thanks for your support, and remember, for a breath of fresh air, watch Tales from SYL Ranch, news and commentary from the heartland. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.